After a particularly bad embarkation day on a cruise a while ago, I decided it was time to sit back and think about how to make an embarkation day successful and stress-free. I spoke to a bunch of experienced and smart cruisers I admire to check my approach was right. I then tested out on a series of recent cruises and I'm sure I now have come up with the definitive way on how you can make a massive difference to your embarkation day, setting you up for an incredible cruise. By the way, if you're new here, I'm Gary Bembridge and it's my goal to make it fun and easy to discover, plan and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations, including on how to ensure you have a totally phenomenal embarkation day. I realized as I thought things through that the reason that embarkation day did not go well had all been created by me. It's all about preparation. It's not sexy, it doesn't sound fun, but it absolutely makes all the difference to embarkation day. There are seven key things I do before embarkation day that made for a successful day moving forwards. First of all, when booking a cruise, I schedule and budget to arrive at least the day before and longer if it's long haul. This has paid off frequently for me. For example, on my recent Oceania Panama Canal cruise that I was recording this just after, there was a storm passing through Europe and my flight was cancelled with just 10 hours to go before the flight. As I'd built in plenty of time to get there, there was time to find new flights, new routings, and I still arrived the day before boarding, admittedly much later than I had planned. Secondly, and this is even more important post shutdown, is I book as early a time to check in at the port as is possible. Now, before the whole COVID shutdown, most smart cruisers just got to the port as early as they could, as the check-in and the boarding was on a first come, first served basis. Now you either book a time to check in or you're allocated a time if you don't. Lines usually turn you away if you arrive before your allocated time. As soon as the system allows, I go in and I book my time. I've been able to get check-in times and be on board ships as early as 11 o'clock in the morning, giving me lots of time to max out embarkation day. Thirdly, I download the Cruise Line app at home while I have good Wi-Fi. These apps have become fundamental to cruises these days. Often I have to use the app to check in and do things like complete the pre-boarding health checks and stuff like that. Fourthly, and this is also much more important today than ever before, is well before embarkation day, I go and check in detail exactly what I'm gonna need to have to have with me for check-in. And I make sure now that I have digital and paper copies of all of those documents. The mistake I made a couple of cruises ago is I had all of the documents I needed, so I was well sorted. But in this case, I needed things like proof of vaccine, test results, country passenger locator forms, and the check-in QR code. I had them all digitally, but the cruise terminal Wi-Fi was terrible and they were really hard and took ages to try and retrieve and all became a bit stressful. So now what I do is I have paper copies but I also put all of those digital files in a folder that I set to work offline. Now I use Dropbox where you can set it to make certain folders offline, but you can use Google or even just the file section on your phone, which you don't need to have Wi-Fi to access. Fifthly, I pre-book everything I possibly can, drinks, Wi-Fi, especially dining, excursions, the spa and whatever else. They're normally cheaper booking them in advance. And also importantly, I get exactly what I want, when I want, and then it frees up time on embarkation day to do some other really important things that I'm gonna discuss a little bit later. Next, when it comes to packing, there's a couple of preparations that I have found makes embarkation day much easier and less stressful. First of all, I pack a carry-on bag and when deciding what goes in there, I ask what do I absolutely need or would hate to lose if I don't get my main check-in bag. For me, it's medication, passport, credit cards, and money of course, cameras, phone, and the charges for those. I could wing the rest of my cruise with just those items because I can buy clothes, I can buy toiletries and stuff like that. By the way, I use the same rule when actually flying to the cruise in case that bag goes missing. The other packing rule to make embarkation day smooth is I make sure that I'm not including in my bags anything that that particular line 
does not allow me to take. Now I've got a whole video around what you can and can't bring on a, a board a ship. However, it actually is two really simple things where I see most people falling foul. They pack extension cords, which most lines do not allow anymore, and they pack more alcohol than they're allowed to bring on. For me, by the way, it's around checking if I can bring my drone or not, because many lines won't permit them anymore. If you've got prohibited items picked up in your luggage when it's screened going on board, you're going to be caught to security and it's going to just disrupt and put a bit of a damp uh, on your embarkation day. With all this preparation in place, getting on board is now smooth and it's stress free. But then once on board is where I still see so many people slipping up. I used to slip up. So what should you do once you get on board? Early on in my cruising life, I would rush around the ship with great excitement until I discovered that I was missing out on putting things in place and setting up the rest of my cruise perfectly. This is actually what I find works best and in this order, surprisingly. First, I go to my cabin immediately to check everything and do a few key tasks. Now, if I booked a guaranteed cabin, of course, I check that I'm okay with the location. Is it all okay? If I've got a balcony, I go out there and check if there's anything that's like to cause disruptions like uh, obstructed views or noisy areas. I make sure that the beds are exactly in the right layout. I also check that everything works, the lights, the safe and the air conditioning. Then I see if the cabin is set up for my quirks. Now for me, I check the pillows because I like feather pillows. And I also check what's in the mini bar if that's included in the fare or the deal. I only drink alcohol free drinks, caffeine free drinks and no sugar drinks. So now I know what I'm going to ask to be adjusted, fetched, fixed or changed. And that's important for when I see my cabin steward or understanding if I need to go to guest services. So the next thing, obviously, based on that is to meet the cabin steward and then normally will be around and come pretty quickly when they know you're there. I then ask them to correct any of those things before they get busy and swamped with all the other guests. Now, if I'm unhappy with the cabin, it also means that I can actually get to guest services really early on before the inevitable long embarkation day lines build. I also at this stage put all my valuables in the safe. I also take photos and video clips of the cabin while it's at its neatest and it's tidiest that it's ever going to be. I quickly check the daily program to see what restaurants are open for lunch. And that's important because I avoid the buffet for embarkation lunch. First of all, because it's the busiest venue. And secondly, because as you're going to see, I can get done some other things that are essential to do on this day. And I can do those in either the main dining room or one of the special restaurants, and I can't do them in the buffet. Now, before leaving the cabin, I watch the e-master video on the television and then go to my master station. Very, very few lines now do the old fashioned set time group master drill. For most of those, you just have to watch a video, go and report in to your station. So I get all of this over and done with, I go and do that. And then I head off to the restaurant for lunch. Now over lunch, there's some important things that you can get out of the way and I get out of the way. Now, as I mentioned, I usually go for lunch in the main dining room, partly because if I'm on fixed dining, I can then go and look at and check my allocated table. If I'm unhappy with it, I can really early on ask the maitre d' to change it because they've still got flexibility before everyone else has asked them. Also, this doesn't apply to me, but if you have any dietary issues or concerns, you can talk to them about these, you know, vegan, vegetarian, gluten free, whatever, and they can then agree with you a plan or how it's going to be addressed or if it's already has been addressed. And again, you're doing that early on. While at lunch, I then put my phone into airplane mode to avoid the huge roaming costs. If the phone connects to the ship satellite service when sailing, you do it once. I had a bill of over $300 because I didn't do that years ago. So now I always do that. I also set the time zone on my phone manually so I can adjust myself the time and stay on official ship time. So I make sure that I do that and don't let the phone set time itself. I log on to the ship Wi-Fi, open the app so I can access things like the daily program. I complete any dining, excursion or spa bookings that I didn't do before. But another reason for going to the main dining room talking about that is if you've not booked any speciality or any time dining slots or you want to change your plans or even you find that the app doesn't allow you, 
you'll find in the main dining room or the specialty dining restaurants, they are usually able to access all the venues and do all of your dining bookings, or if not, there's normally a desk outside those venues or close by, which is set up to do exactly that, so you're in the right place. By the way, one of my big tips for Embarkation Day is I book a specialty restaurant for the first night because it's normally much cheaper, up to 50% less, and they are much quieter on Embarkation Night. Now, if you've got kids, there's one thing that you should do straight after lunch, and that's to go and register them at the Kids Club. Register them, plus if you want to book any extra services, if they're available, like babysitting, you should do it now while there's lots of bookings open. Now, finally, with all of that admin out the way, is when I go and explore the ship. Now, I recommend really strongly that you use the map that's often in the cruise card holder, or perhaps the map on the app, or even go on one of the tours that are run by the ship. Now, the reason for that is there's some structure, and importantly, it means that you won't miss the hidden and the hard to find spots. Now, I've been on a couple of cruises, like for example, Celebrity Silhouette, where I didn't even get to see the amazing Sky Lounge because I hadn't used the map properly until halfway through the cruise, and it was a great venue that I had missed out on. When I was on Virgin Scarlet Lady with some friends, I missed some tucked away lounges, which they loved, and some quiet deck spaces that they found where you could relax and chill with very few people, because again, I didn't do a systematic way of touring, I just kind of ran around the ship looking at things. Also, when I do the tour, I ensure that I go and look at things that I may want to sign up for, like the retreat or the sanctuary area, which have a fee to use. Or perhaps the spa area you know, with the bubbling baths and all that kind of stuff. Now, all of these things are open on Embarkation Day to explore, but after that, free access is closed, so you don't really know what they are, what they're like, and whether it's worth paying to access those things. By the way, I also take photos of the ship now because it's usually still pretty quiet and you get good pictures. As I'm touring the ship, I keep an eye out for Embarkation Day deals and offers, and this is a really important one. The area I focus on, by the way, is the spa. They usually have a raffle draw on Embarkation Day where they have a whole bunch of free treatments that they're offering. So you must be there for the draw, so check what time you need to be back. Now, twice now, I've won that draw and I've had fantastic free massages and free treatments. Now, this whole process may sound a bit regimented approach to Embarkation Day once on board, but I've really found that doing things these ways sets you up fantastically for the rest of the cruise. However, what do you do to make that first evening and the rest of the day really great once you've done all that stuff and you set sail? Go to the sailaway party. I love the sailaway parties because they're exciting. You feel the trip has really begun, leaving port looks fantastic. And I get a sense of the other people on the cruise who are my fellow passengers. You also get to see the entertainment team for the very first time. But importantly, I often meet people that will become friends or certainly familiar faces across the whole cruise. It's often where I get to meet many people who follow the channel, they come up and introduce themselves. And it's great to start making some of those kind of connections. To make the most of my first evening, as I mentioned, I go to a specialty restaurant and usually earlier so that I've then got time to check out what venues are happening, popular and buzzing. It also means that I've got time to go to the introductory show in the theatre. This is a great show because it showcases the different entertainments, what's going to be going on and what to expect so I know what things that I really am likely to want to make sure that I do do and go and see over the course of the cruise. That's how to get embarkation day right. If you want to know how to get disembarkation day right and learn about one of the big mistakes that most people make, take a look at this video where I do start with that really big mistake. See you over there.